The Olden World Written by Tsar Yoshi Chapter 389 Those Who Hunt Valet watched from out of sight against a hull as the pirate ship pursued its prey. The merchant ship the lookout had spotted was real and was sailing away from them as fast as it could, but the pirates had chosen theirs for speed and were gaining rapidly. No attempt at stealth was made, their flag flying proud and the entire crew jeering and salivating on the deck. They wanted the merchants to know they were dead. Settle down, seaweed, the female voice from the bridge valet supposed was the first mate shouted, her vocal cords breaking through the din of the crowd. You know, Captain Golbeth's rules. First, we find out if they're respectable folks, and if they are, we ask politely and professionally that they pay the toll for us keeping the sea safe from the other gangs. And if they don't pay, or if they're goddess-hating Sarosian huggers... The crowd roared, too many different answers blending into a soup of sound in Valet's ears for her to make out. Still, she didn't attack, memories of the flame district fresh in her mind. These pirates weren't nearly as well equipped, but they were still on advantageous terrain with her starting off weakened, and now the entire group was clustered together in one place. She frowned, thinking, if the rest of the boat was unguarded, could she sabotage them? Or was she just underestimating her own skills? But some of the pirates might be veterans. She could fly up and strike from behind. The merchant ship was drawing closer, enough that Valet could make out worried faces on the deck watching as the pirates approached. Whatever she did, she would have to act fast. Mm, need an idea here, she muttered under her breath. The pirate ship's trajectory was slightly off from the merchants, she realized. They weren't intending to ram from behind so much as pull up alongside to board them. Most of the pirates were crowding around the ship's starboard side, leaving their backs to her. Would they be crossing with a gangplank? Maybe, well, they were preoccupied with that, she could make a move. Or, depending on how many flyers the crew had, she could take out the bridge halfway for the boarding, letting her split the pirates in two and fight a smaller force in the merchant ship, then fly over to take on the rest in their own boat. She might also be able to sneak up from behind and pick a pirate or two off in the pre-boarding chaos, and everyone would be so focused on the other boat they wouldn't notice. She had to move in. Spitting her wings, Valet launched herself upward as quickly and quietly as she could, making her way to the crow's nest. It was inhabited by a lone griffin, and all Valet had to do was lock her hooves around the watchbird's neck and slam her head into the mast to knock her unconscious. From below, nobody looked up. It would be an effortless shot to dispense of the unconscious griffin then and there. But Valet still held her hooves and didn't strike. With a grinding of rubber and metal, the boats collided, sides scraping together, and Valet saw an aged, tar-black griffin in the most majestic sea coat of all in a trifold hat standing calmly at the crew's back. Definitely the captain, she decided. He would be a true veteran and her most dangerous opponent. Maybe she should take him out first, but if she got distracted fighting him, the rest of the crew could jump her and make the element of surprise not worth it. In fact, if he was competent, he'd have heckled his crew member for no reason and taken his warning seriously that she was there. It was him or the gangplank. Two ratty stallions were pushing it out by Hoff and Valet realized there was a harpoon head smashed into the other ship's hull preventing it from getting away. Time was passing far too quickly and she needed to decide what to attack. The crew looked evenly comprised of ponies and griffins, meaning more than half of them could fly. The pirate crew was shoved aside roughly by a less scarred female griffin with a heavily plumed hat. The first mate? She strode out onto the gangplank alone, clearly fearless, apparently preparing to negotiate. Valet held her breath as the pirates quieted, waiting for a chance. We are here to parley, the griffin shouted, voice carrying everywhere on both ships. I am Belinda Goldfeather, right talent to his eminence, Captain Golbez the Black. We keep these waters free of lawless freebooters and heretical Sarosians. If your crew is pure, a small fee for our services will be all we require. All we have are cloth and textiles for Vosidel, one of the besieged ponies replied, shivering and bound with his head to the deck. How much do you want? Belinda drummed her talons along the gangplank. Captain Golbez is fair, she mused. A quarter regent in whatever form of payment you can provide. Her beak cracked in a knowing smile. Regents? 
The captive ponies started milling around, turning to each other in panic. Belinda frowned. I didn't think I was asking that much. Maybe you aren't. Excuse me, said a voice from nowhere that set Valet's cutie mark tingling with danger, causing her to look wildly around. Did you say your name was Goldfeather? Yeah. Belinda smirked, lifting her right talon and holding it across her face as if showing something off. Someone who's heard of my heritage? That could change things. Who said that? A figure robed so furrowly in black that not a single hint of their body was visible stepped out of a door in the merchant ship and crossed onto the gangplank, causing Belinda to take a step forward aggressively. She kept her talent up, though, and the newcomer seemed to regard it with passing interest. You have the mockings, he acknowledged. Giovanni Goldfeather, who ascended to his own house in the year 926, and so it dissolved upon his passing three years later. I bet he was your grandfather, oh great. He had nearly eight hundred regions, actual ones and not equivalent value, and you robbed merchants for a fourth. Such a pity so many of the old lords see their bloodlines lost to piracy and heresy against their great goddess, wouldn't you think? Valet sat frozen, watching the confrontation play out as Belinda backstepped, confidence suddenly wavering in the face of a brash aggressor. Who in the misty mountains are you? she spat. No one pities me and lifts to tell the tale. Do you have any children? the intruder asked, entirely unperturbed as she reached for the scimitar at her side. That's none of your business, Belinda snarled, whipping out her sword and wasting no time in slashing it in a nasty arc at the cloaked creature's neck. This is for your insolence! Clang! No, it isn't, her opponent agreed, shaking his head as the blade cracked and shattered, having struck something far harder and better maintained than itself. A gleam of silver sparkled for the small gash she had cut in the cloth, and the hood slipped slightly, revealing a wide row of jagged, perfectly interlocking teeth. I just wanted to know if I'd be ending a royal bloodline today. With a surge of steel, two razor-coated wings sliced their way for the black robe, and Belinda was left defenseless as her opponents surged forward, catching her helpless in a full-body hug as her talons scrabbled defenselessly against metal. She shrieked in pain as he jumped up, flipped both of them around, and slammed her against a bridge in a heavy suplex. With a splintering of wood, the gangplank collapsed under the impact, sending Belinda plunging into the sea. Her opponent ignored her, spiraling upwards until he faced the pirate ship and roared, tattered cloak falling away to reveal a tan pegasus in a gleaming suit of silver armor. Only his ears were rounder, tail long and thin, and tufted at the end, his eyes slitted like a bat pony's and mouth a row of glimmering fangs and his hooves were replaced with paws, gleaming metal spikes on the end of the armor acting as reinforced claws for stabbing and tearing. The entire deck of pirates cowered under the metal sphinx's radiance, some covering their heads and others snarling back battle cries in defiance. The captain, Valet realized, was gone, already winging away over the water to who knew where and abandoning his crew to their fate. She was half tempted to follow him, waves of danger rolling across her from the Sphinx. She was in the wrong boat, and as far as she knew, that meant he would target her in an instant. He was a lone opponent, clad in likely heavy armor and only able to attack from one direction at once, so she was fairly confident she could beat him, but fighting with a member of the Griffin Empire's nobility would be a very good way to start out her time there with powerful enemies. Some flew at him with barbaric courage. They were speared in flashes of red by his bladed forelimbs and wings. Below, the grounded ponies fought between running and getting closer, colliding and tripping over each other as they pushed in different directions, those who managed to break loose and flee for the hatches below decks being flattened as the sphinx flung impaled assailants at them. Most of the throne got back up and charged again, injured and enraged and they blinked. His slices were aimed to hurt, not disable or kill. And he kept grinning with adrenaline, even laughing as the ponies surging around the deck beneath him and throwing whatever they could get their hooves on accidentally pushed one of their own into the sea. Valet narrowed her eyes. Was he doing this for fun? 
She used to fight ponies for fun all the time, she realized. And now she couldn't even launch herself into a 20 against 1 in defense of a merchant ship without wasting precious time hemming and hawing about safety and things. Was this what she used to look like to others? As the fight wore on, though, more and more flyers getting too injured to come back for more, the Sphinx's temperament started changing. He kept glancing over his shoulder at the merchant ship, frustrated as if waiting for something and his strikes grow broader and more brutal. The thrill of battle faded from his eyes until he simply closed his wings and dropped into the pool of ponies stuck on the deck beneath him. With no flare and a shower of red, they fell as one, his armor absorbing every blow. And in seconds, the deck was empty. Every pirate who remained dying or dead. Gerobaldi Stormhoff, the Sphinx shouted, standing up and glancing over his shoulder to the merchant ship. Aren't you going to join in the fun? Every onlooker from his ship had retreated for cover, but at its call, another roped face with a hood drawn back poked around the door. Gazelle, you realize how barbaric you look right now, don't you? The newcomer said with another flash of Sphinx Steve. Please clean and shed your armor before bringing it back into our quarters. Ha! Gazelle removed his helmet, the battle over, and shook his mane, restoring its size and shape. Barbaric or not, your mother asked me personally to get you out of the castle and enjoying the real world, and you were the one who didn't suggest anything when I was deciding what to do. So don't you complain about my choice of sports, Baldy. Valet crouched in sudden interest in the crow's nest, making sure to stay out of sight. Gazelle? That was the Empire's High Prince to whom Kero had requested they deliver that package. Get on over here, Gazelle was saying, urging Gerbaldi over with a beckoning wing. It's shameful to leave a pirate hunt with no kills to your name. Come, I saved you a few. Gerbaldi looked incredibly skeptical, but still spread his wings and soared over, trailing robes that looked more academic than like a disguise. He wrinkled his nose at the smell. I stand by my assertion that this is barbaric, he informed the prince, touching a paw to the bridge of his nose. And against the law. You know it is Gashiva's divine right to give judgment to heretics. Gazelle looked mock offended. So, it's against the law to defend a citizenship from attack, is it? If Gashiva wants so much to kill them herself, she can beat me to them. Besides, it's good sport. Then why'd you let the captain get away, Gerbaldi asked, pointing a skeptical paw at a black dot on the horizon. Gazelle shrugged. Why shouldn't I? Hunt him too efficiently, and the population will dry up. But if you leave the biggest alive, there will be more for next time. Same reason I didn't check to ensure that Goldfeather was finished. She'll make an interesting rival if she survives, becomes stronger, and hunts me down. So much spunk. He glanced fondly at the water between the two ships. Gazelle, she's tainted with heresy, Gerbaldi protested, looking for a way out. Don't praise her! Once again, why shouldn't I? Gazelle threw a winning look over his shoulder before marching forward, looking for the source of the harpoon that trapped the merchant ship. Always respect your opponents, and get your head out of books from time to time. You'd enjoy the world so much more if you realized it doesn't work in such simple idealistic ways. Gerbaldi glanced again toward the water where Belinda had fallen. Make up your mind, Gazelle, he sighed with the conviction of someone who knew they were right and were speaking to a child. Either take the pirates into custody and submit them to the goddess, or end them yourself, all of them. But letting them get away and talking like you admire them is, is what? Gazelle raised an eyebrow. Brash? Foolhardy? No behavior for a leader? He shrugged, tossing up the allegations. Good thing I'm hardly destined for that. Lynn's the one modeling agendas, not me. Until Lord Isvaldi finally passes on and I get my own house, my political influence is limited to my charm and good looks, and that's all about what I say, not what I do. And you have even fewer expectations than I do. Come on, Baldy, live a little. I didn't see anyone fly in or out of the crow's nest, so there's probably a nice and easy lookout covering up there just for you. Don't patronize me, Gazelle, Gerbaldi huffed. I have political influence too, and the knowledge to use it. The influence of a cucumber, perhaps, Gazelle countered, next to what I have purely by being active in the world. 
Go and get yourself a pirate. Just one, enough to get your paw steady. And I'll tell your mother all about what thrilling adventures we had together. And make it sound like you were a real team player. Come on. His eyes started to water in a ridiculous pleading expression, growing so large his pupils were almost round. Gervaldi growled and rolled his eyes. Fine, Prince of Ovis stepping your boundaries. Valet blinked, realizing a very disgruntled sphinx was coming her way. There was a shadow she could hide in, but the sentry she had knocked out was only just starting to stir. There was nothing for it. She dove out of sight, hoping Gervaldi wouldn't blow her cover. With a flapping of wings, he landed in the nest. Uh, he glanced at the stunt griffin, refusing to touch her and looking like she smelled bad. Did she faint from fear or something? He looked a little longer, saw that her sides were moving with breath, and shrugged and turned away. Gazelle, I got one. Now come look and then leave me alone. You did? Gazelle sounded half surprised and half delighted. He soared up himself, perching on limber legs on the sails rigging, and examined the griffin, prodding and checking her himself. Ha! I knew you had it in you! Valet was beyond certain he knew the other things was lying, but had absolutely no intention of outing herself. So, what do you think, Gazelle went on? Your very first pirate victory? We'll make us think out of you yet, Baldy. Care to go clean out the ones that are hiding below decks? I think I'd rather not, Gervaldi said sourly. Let's go home, Gazelle, tell the captain our business is done, payment full, and have him take us back to storm her fortress. Gazelle grinned straight in his face. Or oh, we could fly back together, call it a victory lap. No, Gervaldi spread his wings and left for the merchant ship, abandoning Valet and the stunt griffin. I'm going back inside. Gazelle stood and watched him leave, then sighed. Turning back to the unconscious griffin, he lifted her head and examined it carefully, then straightened up. To whoever's watching me right now, he said under his breath, low enough that the other ship definitely wouldn't be able to hear it. Thanks for not killing him, but it would have gone over poorly with his parents at Stormhoof. Then he left from the crow's nest and was gone as well leaving Valet alone and blinking on the pirate ship. End of chapter 389